To say that our world has changed since the Great War and continues to change is to state the obvious. Progress has been multiform and real, but we have not done away with conflict. We have not mastered the art of preventing it, and we have not even quite learned how to manage and resolve it once it has erupted. But we are at least aware of the limits of our knowledge and are working to improve our understanding of conflict and to develop new tools to deal with it. Let me immediately confess to you very humbly that after all these years of proximity with conflict in different settings and at different times, there is still much I do not know and much I do not fully understand. For example, I have been and continue to be profoundly puzzled by the fact that communities with a solid reputation of being peaceful and even passive become, in certain circumstances, extremely violent. Such was the case of, the, of Cambodia, or in Cambodia from the late 1960s onwards. During the liberation war against French colonial occupation, they left it all to the Vietnamese. But in 1968, a military coup d'etat was engineered by the United States against Prince, Prince Norodom Sihanouk's government. The Cambodians fought like lions and regained control of their country. But the liberators immediately turned against their people. The Khmer Rouge, you will, I'm sure many of you will remember, emptied Phnom Penh of its inhabitants and systematically massacred hundreds of thousands of them in what became known as the killing fields of Cambodia. Similarly, similarly the Lebanese are known to everyone and to themselves as highly sophisticated, refined, gifted for business as well as for the arts, peaceful and fun-loving. From the early 1970s, however, they surprised the world and themselves and became fierce fighters against each other and against the Israeli invader. I have found no ready-made, fully satisfying answers to these questions, neither in the books of academia nor in the toolbox of the practitioner. Perhaps the, the, the truth is much simpler, and that is that we, the members of the human race, are pretty much the same, and that individually and collectively, as the case may be, we are, each and all, capable of the best and of the worst. Circumstances make us one on a given day and make us the other on the next. In dealing with conflicts, uh, it bears repeating, knowledge is key, but that knowledge must be coupled with, amongst other things, humility, patience, respect for others, and readiness to adapt to realities instead of expecting facts to adapt to one's plans and expectations. The military say something to the effect that the best plan does not survive the first bullet and how right they are. A situation, especially a conflict situation, is anything but static. It changes all the time. And from whatever angle one is looking at it, it is imperative to be aware of that changing scene and to adapt to it. And one has to be prepared for the unexpected. Listen to this story. In the summer of 1998, the Taliban made a spectacular advance and took control of more than 80% of the Afghan territory, including the city of Mazar Sharif in the north. There, they assassinated nine Iranian nationals in the consulate of the Islamic Republic of Iran and rounded up well over 100 Iranian nationals, most of them truck drivers trans transporting goods from and to Iran and all of these Iranians were locked up in the Kandahar prison. As you would expect, the Iranian authorities reacted very strongly. 
they actually massed 200,000 soldiers along the border with Afghanistan and threatened to invade the country. I was then the special envoy of the United Nations for Afghanistan, and I naturally tried to see if we could calm the situation and resolve it before everything blew up sky high. I want to see the leader of the Taliban, Mullah Muhammad Omar. He doesn't speak English, and I don't speak Pashto or Farsi. But he had a young uh, translator who did an excellent job, I thought. After well over four hours of discussions, Mullah Muhammad Omar agreed to release all the Iranian prisoners to us and also to, to allow us to repatriate the bodies of the Iranians they had killed in Mazar Sharif. The tension went down, and we at the United Nations were quite satisfied with ourselves. We had prevented the invasion of Afghanistan and the war between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Taliban regime that could have engulfed not only the two countries, but the entire region, uh, region in an extremely dangerous quagmire. But the story does not end there. After some time, that young, man, that young Taliban interpreter, whose name is Rahimullah, sent me a message, the gist of which is the following. Uh, he said in this message, I want to apologize to you, because when you came to see Mullah Muhammad Omar, I did not translate everything you said very faithfully, because I was afraid that some of the things you said would have upset our leader, and that could have led to a failure of your talks. I also smoothed over some of the things Mullah Muhammad Omar said, because they might have offended you. So isn't that really amazing? I had thought that the success of those long and difficult talks were due entirely to my excellent diplomatic skills. And here, I find out that it was not really so, that a young Afghan Taliban in his early 20s had contributed significantly, perhaps decisively, to the successful outcome of my discussions with Mullah Muhammad Omar. And that, that, what, that is what may well have spared Iran, Afghanistan, East and Central Asia and the world, a conflict that would have had these devastating consequences. So, so much for the necessity for diplomats and mediators to be humble. And so much also for good luck. For it was a piece of good luck that we had that intelligent, creative, and courageous young Taliban for an interpreter rather than a professional who would have faithfully translated what was said with God knows what consequences. Uh, I mean, speaking of good luck, Napoleon said uh, that, uh, I think I quote, I think it is a direct quote, I have no use for a general who is not lucky. So you have no use for a mediator who is not lucky. Uh, Bonaparte himself was the luckiest of his generals, only his luck ran out at the gates of Moscow and finally not very far from here. 